Did you test the point? What point did you choose? One, one? Four and four. Four and four, okay. So four, four, by the way, you might notice, um, I've put some coordinates here, not because you necessarily have to, but it just gives me a sense of where I can test, sort of inside or outside. So if I put in four, four, which that means it's somewhere over here. Okay, if I throw that into the left hand side here, I'm getting the absolute value of 4 times 4, which is 16. Is the absolute value of 16 satisfying of this inequality? Cool, it is. So at the very least, I know over here is okay, right? Now, that's the, uh, in one way of saying it, that's the outside of that branch of the hyperbola, right? So it stands to reason, could I do the rest of the outsides as well? Right? Now, most of you have shaded that. Have you done that by testing more points, or did you think about something that led you to that conclusion? Who tested more points? You tested more points, so you're like, yep, cool, I am playing it safe. I, have, like, I don't trust myself, which is totally fine, because then I think that does get you from 7 to 10. You're like, I actually checked. I'm confident. You guys did not. What made you think that, yeah, I can do these bits? Because it was like absolute value. Mm -hmm. If the positive is uh, like, uh, Yep. The regions and the negative loop as well. And then same with the uh, x axis and the y axis. Good, good, good. So these um, two methods, they complement each other, right? This is like, yes, I can brute force this and make sure I can tick everything off. But this way is to say, hold on a second. If I see absolute values, what that should indicate to me, now that I'm in real number land, are you okay with that? Like I don't have any more complex numbers I have to worry about. So in real number land, I can now think of absolute value as. Don't worry about positives and negatives. Just worry about is your number big or is it small, okay? And you know, these numbers over here, uh, what am I gonna have over here? A point like this might be mm, three, negative three, yep. My numbers, forget about the sign, the numbers are getting big as I go over here, just like they got big up here, right? And you can extend the same argument. My numbers are just getting bigger over here, don't worry about the sign. My numbers are just getting bigger over here, don't worry about the sign. Okay, so it does so happen. Good job. You can be confident, back yourself. But do be cautious. I mean, very, this is a common example over here, right? Have you guys encountered this inequality before? Have you seen it? It's a pretty famous example because it breaks, you know, you're just like your easy pattern recognition. If, for example, I told you that um, this part here would lead me to shade this part over here. If I extended my logic over here, just like I might think, I might be tempted to think it's down here, okay? Because it's like the inside and the outside, these branches divide into just two parts. But you'd be wrong. It's this part. And there's two ways that you can think about this. Number one, uh, this graph has a discontinuity, right? Where's the discontinuity? x equals 0, very good. Also has a continuity at y equals 0, but that's not interesting to me here. x equals 0, zero actually breaks this up. There's an invisible wall there, right? So you know how I said before, oh, it kind of looks like, let me draw it one more time. Sorry, this board is such a mess. It looks like there's an inside and an outside, right? It looks like that, but in fact, there is not. This asymptote also breaks things up, okay? The other way to think about it, of course, is if you have y as the subject, then generally speaking, y is greater than means above whatever it is that you've drawn, right? So y is greater than 2x minus 1. Uh, 2x minus 1, what's that? There you go. It's going to be above. This guy, don't even need to test a point. I've already got it in a nice, neat form, okay? All right. How are you feeling? Is your brain okay? You content? Now, I have one last thing to raise with you because we kind of skipped over it. We said it was fine. And I promised you I would you know, actually push you to see if you understood it. All of this is on the assumption that you trust me about this line here. Right? You've had to trust me up until this point. I mean, Justin, you had sort of like a, my spider sense is tingling. I think it's OK. But how could you prove that you can break apart an absolute value into, or I should say, at this point, a modulus? How can I prove that I can separate that modulus into its component parts? I'm just going to let you think while I make myself some space. Hmm. This is harder than it looks, isn't it? Something to do with rotation? That's an interesting thought. Anyone else? <laughs> I'm not going to gratify you yet with saying, yes, that's, of course that's right. I, I want you to think about it. Rotation, by the way, is not a bad instinct because in complex numbers, you know, when you multiply by a complex number, like say i, right, um, what that means is uh, rotation through whatever your argument is, and it also means you um, 
scaled by whatever your modulus is, right? So that's not a bad way of thinking. There is a problem with thinking about it here though, and I'll let you think about it for a second. <coughs> I thought about rotation too, the first time I met questions like this, right? I thought, ooh, is I times something like this, just, you know, rotate it pi on 2, right? When you deal with vectors, um, that does happen, okay? But I want to explain why that happens. If I have some number z like we introduced before, right? And I multiply through by i. Watch what happens, okay? What are you going to get here? ix. And what happens here? Uh, y, like so. Now this is a little bit weird because now my real and imaginary components have kind of swapped, right? So I actually am going to write this in the proper order, real first and then imaginary second. Here's my real part, like so. Here's my imaginary part. So if my x plus i, y was here, there's my x, and that distance there would be y, okay, there's z. What does this guy look like? Well, I'm going to take this distance here, and the real component will be now over there. So there's my y over there. And then here, this x is now the imaginary component. So I'm going to go up, like so. Okay, so can you see that? Now if I draw in the uh, vectors from the origin, it becomes very clear. There's my right angle. Are you okay with that, right? Now why is it that this is not the same as this? It is not just multiplication by, or rotation rather, by 90 degrees pi on 2. The reason why is this is not the complex number you started with, right? That's not x plus i, y. That's that's a real number, right? What's happening with that? The rules are slightly different. Now, here's the way I think, which is nice, which in some ways is a bit like what you did, Sohan. It's like, I'm just going to brute force my way through this. Brute force ways are things you don't want to do in exams because you don't have time for it. But it is something you want to do to prove that things are true for yourself, right? I'm going to go right back to like a general case, right? If I've got two complex numbers, uh, whoops, sorry. Let's keep them together in there. What I want to try and prove is that this is equal to what happens if you take those moduli separately and then multiply. Okay? So I'm saying here, I'm trying to suggest that the modulus of the product equals the product of the moduli. Are you okay with that? Okay. So how would I do this? Well, <clears throat> let's have a look at this guy. If I give these guys some names, like say, uh, let's call this A plus IB and c plus id. That's a pretty common way to break this up. Okay. Um, well, I know what the modulus is. Like, I have a formula for this, right? By definition, through, I rubbed it off, unfortunately, through Pythagoras. What is this guy here? Square root of? Thank you very much. And unlike before, you're like, no, I'm confident. You can prove this, can't you? It's super easy to prove. Just draw yourself a right angle, you're fine, right? What about this guy? c squared plus d squared? Okay, now don't forget, this is a complex number, but A, B, C, and D, what kinds of numbers are they? They're all real, aren't they? Okay, so therefore, because these are all real numbers, they play by the rules that real numbers do. I can combine these square roots like I did before. Um, I'm going to get this. Mm. It's a little bit messy, but it's not hard. Uh, oh, that's a B. Are you content with that? And there's not much more you can do with that. I've expanded everything out. This is the final point. Okay? I've started from this point here, and then I've used my knowledge of complex numbers and moduli and what have you. Now let's see what happens if I start from up here. I need more space. Can you write that out for me? Write out the, the modulus, rather, of z1, z2. And I want you to see, being that we've just provided a definition for z1, this guy, and a definition for z2, this guy, can you multiply through first, multiply those complex numbers together, and then see what happens when you take the modules? I'll give you a little bit of a head start.
Fíjate. Okay, how do you feel now? Do you feel better? I hope there's a part of you that's like, oh, now I don't just accept that this is true, now that I know that this is true. I haven't even finished there. I'm like, I've gone far enough. Like, I'm content with that, okay? Now, can I just make one last sort of um, conclusion um, by bringing a parallel from this to when you first learned how to differentiate, what was the very first thing we taught you to do? Do you remember? Within differentiation? I'll give you a clue. It starts with this. What did we learn? We learned limits so that we could do differentiation by first principles, right? And you guys are like, oh man, especially if you've ever encountered differentiation before, you're like, but I know rules. Why can't I just like use rules instead of this awful 10 times longer way of doing things, right? And the answer is not because you were, apart from like once in a very early assessment, it's not because we're going to require this particular skill of you. We want you to have a kind of way of thinking that like, I don't know if this is true, you know what, I can go back to something earlier, something I can rest on. This is just rise over run, isn't it? Just this gradient. I can know something that's confident and then build off of that and say, yes, I have a conclusion that I know is trustworthy. Does that make sense? So, um, if you get a question like this, um, you don't obviously need to do any of this, but now that's part of your uh, mental vocabulary for how you can move through this and why you know you can separate that out into its pieces. Okay. Does anyone have any questions?